Millions of these Asian carp were once imported by the US government with the promise that they would save the ecosystem and allow humans to control nature in a way never seen before. But just a few years later, everything spiraled beyond control in ways scientists had never anticipated. Massive barriers costing hundreds of millions of dollars have been built with one single purpose, to stop this fish from advancing. Today, what was once hailed as a scientific achievement is heading straight toward America's largest freshwater system, where a single mistake could trigger an ecological disaster across the entire country. So what exactly was the US plan when it brought this species here? Why did a project meant to save nature become a nightmare now haunting the whole nation? And can we stop it before it's too late? Let's find out. Before everything slipped out of control, America once prided itself on having tamed the Mississippi. This colossal river, stretching more than 2,300 miles, had long been the lifeblood of the continent, nourishing farmland with its sediment, sustaining millions through fishing, and nurturing riverside towns that grew and thrived for centuries. Further north, the Great Lakes were known as America's freshwater treasure, not only supplying drinking water to more than 30 million people, but also serving as the backbone of a domestic fishing industry that once generated billions of dollars a year. In the mid-20th century, the U.S. economy was booming, the population was rising rapidly, food demand was climbing, and aquaculture was expanding faster than ever. Across southern states like Arkansas, Kentucky, and Tennessee, fish farms spread across the landscape, providing cheap protein to millions of families. For farmers, it was a pathway out of poverty, for the government, it was a cornerstone of national food security. But it wasn't long before an unexpected problem surfaced quiet, but relentless. The ponds, once thought to be closed ecosystems, began to change. The water turned dark green as algae bloomed. Plankton exploded out of control, consuming oxygen and killing fish by the thousands. In summer, thick layers of white foam floated on the surface, filling the air with a foul stench. In winter, sediment built up so heavily on the pond floors that they turned into stagnant dead pools with no productive value. For southern fish farmers, this was more than a technical nuisance. It was an economic nightmare. Yields dropped by as much as 40% in many farms. Costs for cleaning ponds, treating water, and restocking fish doubled or tripled. Many small-scale operations went bankrupt and shut down. Riverside towns that had depended on fish processing and trade began to see waves of outmigration. And as the aquaculture industry struggled, another consequence emerged. Drinking water supplies were threatened, and outbreaks of intestinal diseases linked to toxic algae began to appear, directly affecting public health. Federal and state authorities did not sit idle. They tried everything. Chemical algicides were poured into ponds in hopes of restoring biological balance, but they killed beneficial organisms too, making the situation worse. Industrial filtration systems were installed, costing tens of thousands of dollars per pond, but the results were short-lived and unaffordable for small farmers. Some places experimented with natural restoration by introducing aquatic plants to clean the water, but they grew too slowly to keep up with the explosive spread of algae. All efforts failed. And as one failure followed another, a sense of helplessness swept across America's aquaculture sector. Reports from Arkansas to Kentucky all carried the same message, we can no longer control this biological chain. At the same time, another fear was growing at the federal level. Without a solution, the nation's food supply chain could be at risk. The Mississippi, once a river that sustained the Midwest, was now carrying massive nutrient loads into the Gulf of Mexico, creating vast dead zones that killed millions of wild fish and devastated the traditional fishing industry. People living along the river began asking an uncomfortable question. Was humanity's effort to master nature now turning against itself? In that climate of urgency, the search for a miracle solution became more desperate than ever. The government wanted to save the aquaculture industry. Farmers wanted to save their livelihood. Scientists wanted to prove that humans could indeed control nature. And then, just as hope seemed to be running out, a bold proposal emerged, an idea from across the Pacific, hailed as a living filter, and the key to restoring biological balance without the need for chemicals or expensive technology. The problem was that no one asked the simplest question. If we call upon nature to fix the mistakes we made, will nature really stop where we want it to? In 1972, after a series of emergency meetings between agricultural and environmental agencies, the United States officially gave the green light to what was then considered a revolutionary breakthrough in aquaculture, importing a group of fish from Asia to clean ponds and control plankton populations. 
They were silver carp, big head carp, and grass carp, three natural filter feeders that had been used in China and Vietnam for decades with what were described as astonishing results. For American experts at the time, the idea seemed like a perfect answer to the problem that had plagued the industry. These fish could consume vast amounts of plankton every day without the use of chemicals. They grew quickly, reproduced prolifically, were harmless to humans, and did not prey on other fish. Most importantly, they had little commercial value, which meant they wouldn't be overfished. In the eyes of policymakers, they were the perfect biological filtration system, an invisible workforce that would clean ponds without further human intervention. In Arkansas, the first shipments of fish were released into experimental farms. The initial reports were cause for celebration. Algae levels dropped by as much as 80%, pond water cleared, and commercial fish yields soared within months. Farms, once on the brink of bankruptcy, were thriving again. Newspapers at the time even called them the miracle fish, the species that could fix humanity's mistakes. It wasn't just the aquaculture industry that benefited. Small southern towns began considering the fish for their reservoirs to cut water treatment costs. Some states planned large-scale releases into irrigation canal systems to improve water quality. At the time, almost no one asked the question, could there be side effects? Because everything seemed to be going exactly as planned. What reassured everyone most was the belief that the fish could not survive outside of captivity. Experts at the U.S. Department of Agriculture insisted the species required specific conditions to reproduce, meaning they would never form populations in the wild. A few small field studies were conducted, and the results only reinforced that confidence. Reports sent to Washington were filled with words like safe, effective, and low risk. That confidence paved the way for a series of decisions that would later prove disastrous. Not just Arkansas, but Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, and several Midwestern states began importing the fish for water treatment projects. By the late 1970, hundreds of thousands had been released into ponds, reservoirs, and canals. Everyone believed they were in control. Beneath the optimistic numbers and glowing reports, a few faint warnings did surface. Some independent ecologists pointed out that no one really understood the fish's reproductive cycles in natural environment. A few warned that if they ever escaped, they could alter the food web in ways humans could not predict. But those voices were quickly dismissed. The results were too good to question. And that was the trap of success. People began to believe they could program nature. They thought that if they simply chose the right species and placed it in the right environment, the ecosystem would function according to human design. They believed that with science, humanity had gained the power to redirect the course of nature without paying a price. But nature has never been a simple equation. And a few years later, when heavy rains swept across the American South and water overflowed the pond banks, the first few thousand fish quietly slipped out of the places they were meant to help. They followed small channels into larger rivers. They swam farther than anyone had imagined. And in places they were never meant to be, something no one had considered began to unfold. What had once been a biological solution was now becoming an uncontrollable variable. And as the Mississippi opened like a gateway to the entire continent, humanity's faith in its ability to correct its own mistakes would soon be tested in ways no one expected. No one ever imagined that a few thousand fish released into southern ponds could rewrite the ecological map of an entire continent. But just a few years after they escaped, the unimaginable happened. They not only survived, they grew faster, stronger, and more adaptable than anyone had predicted. In the wild, they were no longer limited by pond size or scarce food. A single mature female could lay up to 5 million eggs in one season, and with virtually no natural predators, more than 70% of those eggs survived to reproduce again. In less than a decade, they had spread into more than 80% of the tributaries in the Mississippi River system, traveling thousands of miles from their original release sites. Scientists who once confidently declared that this species cannot reproduce in the wild quietly erased those conclusions from their reports. The impact of the invasion quickly went beyond ordinary biological disruption. As Asian carp made up 80 to 90% of the total biomass in many river sections, the food web collapsed and rebuilt itself from the ground up. Native filter feeders like paddlefish and gizzard chad vanished from many areas. Bluegill, sunfish, and buffalo fish once the backbone of the river ecosystem declined sharply as they failed to compete for food. As the base of the food chain disappeared, so did the middle and upper levels. Migratory waterfowl lost their prey, while otters and mink abandoned the rivers in search of food elsewhere. Entire ecological systems, built over millions of years, began to crumble all because of one seemingly small decision. 
To understand the scale of the disaster, it helps to see it in the broader context of American ecological history. For more than a century, the U.S. has faced numerous biological invasions. Zebra mussels from Europe clogged water pipes and power plants. Emerald ash borers from Asia killed hundreds of millions of hardwood trees. Kudzu vines smothered southern forests under a suffocating green blanket. But none of them spread as fast or caused as much widespread destruction as the Asian carp. Consider this. Zebra mussels, one of the most notorious invasive species, took more than 30 years to spread from the Great Lakes to southern rivers. Asian carp did it in just 12. Moving north from the south, crossing thousands of miles of rivers, overcoming dozens of natural and man-made barriers. Emerald ash borers cost the forestry industry $300, $400 million per year, but Asian carp inflict more than $1 billion in annual losses on America's inland fisheries, more than all other freshwater invasive species combined. And that's just the present. NOAA projections from 2019 warned that if they breached the final barrier and entered the Great Lakes, the economic damage could exceed $12 billion a year, more than the GDP of Vermont or Wyoming. The freshwater supply for more than 30 million people could be at risk. The food web of a region containing nearly one-fifth of the planet's surface freshwater could collapse entirely. Meanwhile, the social consequences became increasingly visible. The recreational fishing industry, once worth $7 billion annually, lost nearly half its revenue. Commercial fisheries declined by as much as 70% in many areas. River towns that had thrived on fishing became ghost towns. And as carp populations exploded, they even created a physical hazard. Hundreds of accidents caused by leaping fish were recorded in Illinois and Missouri. Some fishermen suffered broken bones, head injuries, even permanent disabilities, outcomes no one had ever imagined from an environmental solution. The ecosystem changed. The economy collapsed. Communities fell apart and it all began with a small decision on southern fish farms half a century ago. If zebra mussels clog pipes and emerald ash borers destroy forests, Asian carp are reshaping the entire freshwater ecosystem of a continent. Experts now call them the perfect invader, a species that doesn't need to hunt or fight, it simply survives, and survives too well. And when the first carp were discovered just a few dozen miles from the waterways leading into the Great Lakes, America faced a chilling realization. They were no longer fighting to eradicate them, they were fighting just to maintain the status quo before everything collapsed. Because once the fish reach North America's largest freshwater system, there will be no control or mitigation plan capable of saving it. It will be the greatest biological disaster in U.S. history, a mistake that cannot be undone. But nature doesn't stop there. Once balance is broken, the consequences ripple far beyond the river, onto land, into the climate, and into human life in ways no one can control. And that is when the spiral of escalation truly begins. When the United States realized its biological solution had spun out of control, it launched a full-scale counteroffensive. But every action humans took opened the door to new, more complex problems, as if nature was always one step ahead. The first step was mass removal. State governments spent millions hiring commercial fishermen to haul carp out of the rivers. Hundreds of tons were removed each year, but after a single spawning season, populations rebounded as if nothing had happened. With their staggering reproductive capacity, every attempt to reduce their numbers proved meaningless. Next came electric barriers, the strategy many hoped would stop the fish from reaching the Great Lakes. More than $300 million was spent building underwater barriers along the Illinois River to deliver electric pulses. Yet, just a few years later, carp DNA was detected beyond the barrier. No one knew how they got through. Perhaps eggs had drifted with the current, or maybe they had simply found another way. The harsh reality was that humans drew the lines, and nature always found a way to cross them. Some states tried biological methods introducing new predators or manipulating reproduction, but these approaches carried major risks. Predators could become new threats, while chemicals designed to control reproduction might harm native species and contaminate drinking water. The harder people tried, the more complex the problem became. Meanwhile, nature began to strike back. With the food web disrupted, toxic algae blooms erupted in many freshwater systems, contaminating drinking water supplies. Oxygen-depleted dead zones appeared in the lower Mississippi, where life could no longer exist. Insects and disease-carrying mosquitoes flourished as native fish populations declined. Each new consequence required another response, creating an endless chain of escalation. Riverside communities began to feel the consequences firsthand. Traditional fisheries were no longer profitable. Tourism plummeted as rivers lost their appeal. 
Some river towns saw their populations decline as residents were forced to leave in search of work. Problems that had once been confined to aquaculture ponds had now spread into society itself. More and more, the question was no longer, how do we eradicate them? But are we controlling anything at all? What began as a small intervention had triggered a chain reaction no scientific model could predict. Every human action was met by a stronger reaction from nature, a stark reminder that this order was never ours to command. Now, the United States has no choice but to bet everything on its final options. Fragile gambles, that balance between redemption and repeating the same mistakes. But is there still time? After decades of failure, America has slowly accepted a hard truth. Asian carp cannot be wiped out. The fight is no longer about eradication, but about containing them and preventing their spread into untouched waters. And to do that, the country has launched a series of last-ditch strategies, each one fraught with risk. The most important is the multi-layered barrier system, combining electricity, sound, light, and bubbles. The largest project, the Brandon Road Lock and Dam in Illinois, costs nearly $1 and billion, and is considered the final gate before the Great Lakes. These barriers emit electrical pulses to repel fish, high-frequency sounds to force them to change direction, and curtains of bubbles to stop eggs from drifting downstream. Yet even supporters admit that no barrier is completely foolproof. Another approach is to turn the threat into a resource. Some states are encouraging the harvest of carp for animal feed, fertilizer, and even restaurant menus. The goal is to create commercial pressure to help reduce populations. But the fish reproduce far faster than demand can keep up, limiting the impact of these efforts. At the same time, scientists are pursuing deep biological interventions. Researchers are studying hormones and bacteria that could reduce reproduction without harming native species, and even experimenting with gene-editing techniques to create sterile fish. But they acknowledge the risks. A single mistake could unleash a new ecological disaster, even harder to control than the current one. Finally, a new strategy is emerging, giving nature back its role. Some projects focus on restoring ecosystems, rebuilding wetlands, reintroducing native species, and reconstructing the food web. The goal is not eradication, but creating an ecosystem strong enough to balance itself. This path is slow and expensive, but it may be the only truly sustainable solution. Whatever the approach, they all share one thing. No one can guarantee success. Asian carp are no longer just a fish. They are now part of a new ecosystem that humans unintentionally created. And in this game, the most we can hope for is to slow the process, to hold on to a final shred of control before everything slips beyond our reach. But after all these desperate measures, one question still looms. Can humanity learn anything from this mistake, or will history repeat itself with another species, on another day, in the not-so-distant future? Nearly half a century has passed since these fish were released under the belief that they would help humanity clean up nature. But now, they stand as living proof of a deeper truth. Nature is not a tool for humans to manipulate at will, and every time we try to rewrite its rules, the price we pay is far beyond what we ever imagined. Asian carp are no longer just an invasive species. They are a symbol of arrogance, the belief that humans can fix anything with a quick and simple solution. But nature does not bend to political agendas or economic goals. It responds slowly, persistently, and sometimes irreversibly. And when the balance is broken, it is we who must live with the consequences. Today, billions of dollars have been spent to control their populations, to stop them from reaching the Great Lakes, and to save the ecosystem. Yet, despite all these efforts, the fish continue to expand their territory. No one knows whether the barriers, projects, or technologies will be enough to stop them. And if they fail, the cost future generations will face may be far worse than anything we can imagine. At its core, this story is no longer about fish. It is a warning about how we interfere with nature. Every introduced species, every dam, every cleared forest is a gamble, and each gamble can trigger a domino effect that cannot be stopped. So the biggest question is no longer, how do we control Asian carp? But do we have the humility to accept our limits? Do governments have the courage to learn from this mistake? Or will history repeat itself with another name, another creature, and an even greater cost? What do you think? Can humanity truly repair the damage it has inflicted on nature? Or have we gone too far to turn back? 